please welcome to the stage Morenike Giwa Onaiwu. Well, the great thing about having all these bright lights is I don't have to make eye contact with any of you. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm going to get started. Um, my presentation is longer than the other two that you had, so I do apologize for that. But hopefully, um, it will be worth your while. There is plenty of wine over there, so you know you'll be all right. Um, but I, the, the another thing I want to say before we play a quick video. Um, I want to say a couple of things, is that um, I like scripting. I always have, since I was a child. My children say that there's not a, a situation that I don't have a song lyric for. And so when I saw this space, um, I walked in and I was like, wow, this place is just, it's cool, it's beautiful. It feels like I'm you know, in a spoken word or a comedy you know, club or something like that. And so there was a part of me that just was so, so much wanted to just kind of do that scene from 8 Mile. Hey, everybody from the 313, throw your M effing hands up and follow me. So I just had to get that out or I won't be able to, <laughs> to proceed. <laughs> All right, so now that that's done, I can be a little more professional. <laughs> so, um, I am Marenike Giwo Naiwu, and I am a, an autistic woman. Um, I'm obviously black, you know, not just super tan. And um, when I was trying to think of an, an, an kind of an icebreaker or an example that I would give before um, my actual presentation itself, I thought of something that was so absolutely ridiculous that I have to share it with you. Um, because it's, it, I was trying to think, okay, being black, being autistic, you know, okay, the, there's so much to unpack, and you'll see, and that's why I'm gonna talk for 40 minutes. But um, I, the first thing that came to my mind wasn't the best thing, but it was, it was a truthful thought. I thought back to when I was a little girl. And um, when I was a little girl, I had natural hair, and all of the little girls started getting, you know, their hair when you get older in the black community. Hopefully it's changing, at least with my daughters. But there's a kind of rites of passage. When you get to a certain age, you chemically process your hair, either with a relaxer to straighten it, or when I was younger, um, a, um, a curl, a jerry curl is what they called it. And so you guys are on the East Coast, but if you're on the West Coast, that, that was the thing to do, the jerry curl. You know. <laughs> and I got one, and I absolutely hated it because it was a sensory nightmare. The smell, the feeling of the stuff, it was just, it grossed me out um, to the point where I, I literally never put the, the product that you're supposed to put to keep it all curly and glossy on, and um, it dried out and basically fell out and had to start all over, and I was glad. I was so glad because it was disgusting to me. And it was interesting because when I think about it, I was like, okay, well, you know, why is it that so many people were able to, you know, wear that hairstyle for years and years? I mean, that's how Michael Jackson's hair caught on fire. You know, he had one of those. You know what I mean? Why were people able to wear it? And they could dance and be everywhere and just so excited and happy, and I couldn't even stand it for a day. And I realized that those were some of the many hidden cues about my sensory differences that I didn't know about for until, you know, I, th nearly three decades later. So for a little comic relief before the actual presentation starts, I'm going to show you a quick video from the movie Coming to America. Um, it's a commercial called Soul Glow. You, know, you can be all the things you always wanted to be. Beautiful. Sexy. One, two, three. Just let your soul go. Just let it shine through. Just let your soul go, baby. Feel it all so silky smooth. Just let it shine through. Yeah. Just let your soul go. So glow. Perhaps I should cut off my prince's luck. No. Yes. You must be out of your goddamn mind. Don't do it. <laughs> Sorry, I can't watch that without laughing, but. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna get into the actual presentation itself. Thank you for bearing with me uh, about that. And so um, my presentation is entitled um, The Intersection Between Race and Autism. And I put in gender because this is a flying university about women on the spectrum. I am a, a woman on the spectrum. And so um, um, this is me, I'm Marenike Giwo Naiwu. Um, if you're using social media, um, then I'm at Save Ryan White D on Twitter. Um, that's the Twitter handle I use for the Ryan White Part D um, advocacy, which is a program for um, HIV affected families from um, birth to adulthood. And so you're welcome to. 
Um, follow along if you need. So I'm not really a stuffy presenter. So if you need to move around, if you're tired of sitting because you've been sitting in Karoff, you need to move around, move around. Um, please don't you know, bother people or anything when you're moving. But feel free to use technology. So if you want to, I don't even know if you have reception because we're kind of you know, on a lower floor. But if you want to tweet things out on social media or whatever, take pictures. And consider flapping. Um, I'm kind of partially a sensory seeker and partially an avoider. So clapping usually doesn't bother me. I mean, I expect clapping if you're in a venue like this, unless it's like all autistic people, then I don't. Um, but, you know, just putting that, there's a couple of, um, you know, just housekeeping reminders for you all. Um, you aren't, aren't going to just, you know, make me feel bad if you need to go to the restroom or you need to move around or whatever. It's cool. So <clears throat> this is kind of the overarching theme or philosophy that I want to share that kind of undergirds my entire presentation. So I'm going to be talking about autism from the perspective of neurodiversity. Um, and that's the, um, this was coined by Nick Walker this, um, in terms of this definition. There's many definitions, but it's essentially that um, all of us, like you look around this room, it's very unique. I mean, New York is one of the most diverse places in the United States. You have people from all walks of life. We have people from all backgrounds, and we have probably just as much, if not as uh, many more types of brains all types of different ways to be. And all of this is just a variation of the human species and there's nothing wrong with any of them. Just like there's nothing wrong with any of your gender identities or your height or your race or what have you. So this is, just kind of keep this in mind. I am not, as an autistic woman, I am not talking about autism from a deficit perspective at all. I'm talking about it as a, a part of my identity just as much as my name or my you know, ethnicity or my gender or what have you. So. Why should you care about any of this? I mean, some of you are autistic, some of you are not. But um, this is kind of basically just a, a, a slide to talk about. So women are misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed a lot. Within communities of color, which we'll talk about that more, it's even more. Um, it happens even more so. Um, and there are a lot, the, the reason why this is focusing on women on the spectrum is because women are kind of an afterthought. I mean, if you think about light it up blue, Anyway, um, it, blue is I perceived as a boy color. I'm not going to talk about the organization that does that yet, but um, <laughs> but essentially they're not um, inc ex inclusive of autistic women and girls. And by when I my definition of girls is an inclusive uh, women and girls is inclusive. So that's cisgender and transgender women. Um, and then there's I suppose to say considerable bias that exists as well. So this is why we need to talk about this. This is why this is an important topic. So the intersection of race and gender. So when things intersect, if you think about intersecting lines in math class when you're a kid, they're meeting, they're coming together. So I wanted to just take a, a moment to talk about what intersectionality is and what it ain't. Okay, so a lot of people talk about intersectionality, we hear it all the time. It is, it, it has kind of morphed to have a new meaning in terms of all of us have different intersections or overlapping, or overlapping identities about who we are. So that is true. You, um, someone could stand up here and they could be like, oh, you know, they could be queer, they could be, you know, Muslim, they could be, you know, deaf, they could be whatever, liberal. You know, they could have all these varying different identities that overlap. However, the initial definition of intersectionality, um, if you're not familiar, I just always like to give props to the people who founded things, were, was Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and so essentially, she was looking at the fact that people with marginalizations, multiple marginalizations, the intersection of the different things that make us different, make things more complex. So it's a lot, it, you know, we all have different privileges and we all have marginalizations as well. And so it's different. It's not the case of, it's, it's a, the intention of the term was initially supposed to be um, used for individuals with marginalization. So individuals of color with disabilities, what have you. So now it's kind of been a, become a catch-all word and there's nothing wrong with it. But I, it's just important to understand the, the context from which the, the term even came. Um, that's important to, to kind of look at. So. Intersectionality is more than just a term that you see all over social media. It's important. You know, Audre Lorde, you know, talks about how we don't live single issue lives. Um, a lot of us have lots of things that, are, that we're passionate about. I'm passionate about um, autism. I'm also passionate about HIV advocacy. I'm also passionate about racial justice, about adoption, about a lot of things. So when these two or more systems of oppression come together, you know, essentially it's a lot different. I am an English speaker. 
you know, and I am a speaking autistic. So that is something um, my, I have a privilege that someone who is a non-speaking autistic doesn't have. But if that person is a white, you know, cisgender Christian male, and I am a black, you know, woman or what have you, then we've got some things that, you know, I, these are two areas in which where I am, I'm lacking privilege in those areas, even if I have privilege in another area. So, speaking of privilege, autism has a white privilege problem. It does. There are a lot of disparities in autism. And I know people are tired of hearing these terms, but I mean, it's just the truth. Because we know, we all know that autism is no respecter of person. It can, uh, it can occur, and it does occur. It's, you know, in anyone. It's a naturally occurring, you know, condition that you can find in people of all walk, walks of life. We know that, but that's not what we see when we look at data and statistics. We see a lot of disparities with regard to autism. I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, so with regard to identification and referral, I'm going to give you some, so I know Sarah said she was going to give some boring stats. I liked her stats, personally. Mine might be boring, but they're interesting to me. Um, because when I talk, I am going to share some things from personal experience, but I like to back what I'm talking about with fact. Because I, do, I can give you anecdotal, and I think that there's, there's an important place for that. But there's also an important place to see literally exactly what's happening, what's going on. So um, there are a number of research studies that I reviewed when putting this presentation together. And with regard to identification and referral, um, there are studies that have demonstrated that doctors are more likely not to use the gold standard in terms of screening and evaluation tools that are used for screening a child with a developmental delay and most likely um, and possibly in autism. Um, diagnosis, they're less likely to use those um, in children of color. Um, they're also less likely to make a referral to a developmental specialist or what have you, even if the child is presenting with a delay. Um, in some cases, there was as much as a 15.5 month delay. That's over a year. Um, on the flip side, um, there's some data that African-American parents may be less likely to perceive or report certain social communication difficulties as a concern. So. You've got a parent, maybe their child's not, you know, you know, likes to line things up like, you know, my son still does. Um, or they flap their hands, or they're using a lot of repetitive language or what have you. And maybe that parent isn't worried because they're like, oh, that's just how JJ is. No worries. You know, it's cool. You know, he's well behaved. He's, you know, seems happy. He seems okay. That parent may not think that's a big deal. Oh, he'll grow out of it. If he's autistic, he's not going to grow out of it. But the point is, the parent is not really that worried about the thing. So they may also may not come to the, when they're asking you questions, we all know the way the medical system is these days. You're in that room, you're in and out pretty quickly. And they're not spending an hour with you just at a pediatrician's appointment. Um, and so if you don't, sometimes if you don't share some, something, of it, as if you don't think it's a concern, then they're not looking for it. So. Um, the research has found that um, if there is a behavioral issue, the parent will mention the behavioral issue, but they're less likely to mention the little quirks. They don't really think it's a big deal that you know he you know talks all day long about you know robots or whatever. It's not. It's cute, you know. But if he's fighting or you know self injurious behaviors or what have you, then the parent may share it. So the the statistics of parents of color and parent and white parents sharing those concerns were the same. But the in terms of um, children of color, they're more likely to be misdiagnosed as having some type of other psychiatric disability. Um, and so, um, in addition to that, with diagnosis, so there's just some staggering numbers I want to give to you. Depending on the studies you're looking at um, and the, the data from the CDC, white children are between 19 to 30 percent more likely to be diagnosed with autism than an African American child. Um, and they are between 50 and 65 percent more likely than a child that's Hispanic or, or Latin. Now, another statistic that's um, concerning is that Hispanic and Asian children are more likely to be diagnosed with both um, autism and an intellectual disability. So in the case of when they're not presenting with cognitive difficulties, they might fall through the radar. Um, so this is a concern um, with diagnosis, a huge concern. Another diagnosis, diagnostic concern in terms of this, the white privilege problem with diagnosis is that African-American children are, um, are slated to be diagnosed between one and a half to two years later than their white peers. And we're controlling for socioeconomic status, education, and all of these things, um, and, um, you know, and symptomology in, with these terms. Um, another one is treatment and access. So um, with it, when there is a, um, when you are of a um, social, economic status where you are struggling, um, there's often uh, up to a three-year time, three time lag in between diagnosis 
and ac accessing treatment. With people of color, it's even higher. Um, also, white children um, on the spectrum are more likely to um, two, I'm sorry, two-thirds more likely than children of color to be receiving a variety of services. So um, a child of color, a Hispanic child or a black child may only be getting services at their school district um, or may only be getting services through a speech therapist, but it's more likely that a, a, a white child will be referred to a variety of services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, what have you, and you know, to kind of complement and give them the resources that they need. And while I'm no fan of over-therapizing, I am a fan of meaningful supports, and if a person needs supports, then, you know, we want them to be able to access them and assist you um, in, in building your strengths. In terms of perception as well, um, students with disabilities are two times more likely to be suspended than children without disabilities. When you add a child of color, the number increases even more. Um, and then in terms of, um, so there were some, there was some data that was ran um, by the Department of Edu Education about autistic students of color and white autistic students. White autistic students were more likely to be diagnosed as an AU, you know, classification or category in their school district. But a lot of the autistic children who were of color, particularly African American, were labeled as um, specific learning disability or, or um, emotionally disturbed. There are certain services, resources, and protections that you do not get when you are mis um, when you are misperceived that way, when you are mis um, you know when you're not labeled appropriately, and then that leads to disparities in outcomes. So children of color in general are more likely to be arrested at school. Um, and, and when um, disabled children of color um, have a dropout risk that's almost double the, that of other um, children of color. Um, so this, these are major concerns. These have impacts beyond when they're children. Children grow up and become adults. So beyond the white privilege problem, there's a male problem. Um, a male privilege problem in autism as well. Sarah touched on it some. And so this is with regard to women and diagnosis, women and girls. And I'm gonna go a little quick bit faster through these stats because I want to share some other things with you all. But there is a lot of information. Women and girls are not identified and referred as quickly because of the camouflaging skills that women tend to, to present with. They present differently and people perceive autism as more of a male thing. Even in some of the biomedical research, you know, you see that terminology. Um, boys are four times more likely to be diagnosed and women are often diagnosed later in adolescence, in adulthood, after being early diagnosed with depression or OCD or you know, anxiety or a variety of different labels that were not necessarily accurate. Um, and we are perceived as not really autistic when people don't realize behind the scenes the many coping mechanisms that we're putting in place to just do what neurotypical people do without even thinking. You know, we exhaust ourselves from pretending to be normal, or even if we're not pretending to be normal, even if we're comfortable in our own skin, just from functioning in a world that's not designed for us. So we're seen as not having a legitimate disability when society is not, is not at all very inclusive or welcoming of autistic people, whether you're a male or female. Um, and so we use these coping mechanisms, our declarative memories, our social scripts, guide, and we use guides, we'll have an extroverted friend or what have you to help us navigate things. Or we'll go do um, an event and then we'll cocoon ourselves away for days to function. And th this is not what's seen by others. So therefore the disparities that we have in terms of, so we're perceived in this way and there's a lot of disparities. I'm, giving some, I'm gonna give some stats. These are for disabled women. These are not isolated for autistic women. I wish they were, but unfortunately kind of like Sarah said, in a lot of these um, studies, there are so few women that are, they are, that are even in, you know, included a lot of the time in studies of, of any substantial size that I can't give you know, data that I could feel would be um, you know, accurate to you. There is data, but it's not one that I feel comfortable sharing. Um, and so um, disabled women in general, in comparison to their non-disabled peers, are four times more likely to be raped they are two and a half times more likely to be a victim of some other type of sexual violence. So maybe forced fellatio, maybe fondling, maybe what have you, maybe being sexually harassed in some way. We saw the Me, the Me Too movement, need I say more. Um, two times more likely than a non-disabled woman to be a victim of physical, I'm sorry, to, um, not a victim, we're not victims, we're survivors, to experience physical violence. Three times more likely to be stalked. Two times more likely to experience psychological abuse two times more likely than a non-disabled woman to have our reproductive rights, our, our own bodily autonomy denied, either not allowed to use birth control or forced to get an abortion or what have you, um, or forced to, care, you know, to bear children when we're not ready. And in terms of leaving our abusers, a lot of the programs that are set up for intervention are not 
um, disability friendly, and they also don't take into account that if you're a person with a disability, you might be dependent financially, emotionally, you know, and possibly even physically, because there's co-occurring, you know, di um, um, conditions you might have on this partner. So it's not as simple as just walk away from that toxic person and go to the shelter um, that's loud and um, and doesn't allow you to, you know, do things that you need to do to calm yourself or to cope. So there's a lot to be unpacked here in terms of these disparities aren't just, oh, well, so they're missing some women. Oh, they're missing some black and Hispanic people, Asian people. And it's not an and. It's, it's a concern. Because we're right here, and we've always been right here, hiding in plain sight. I like the work of this artist. Um, we are here. You know, the, uh, autism can be, present, can be found in any gender, race, age, class, cultural orientation. We are right here. You know, but are you seeing us? We've got, I want to talk a little bit about um, worldview and so in, in perception and worldview. So we know cognitively that this thing is not moving, but it certainly looks like it's spinning. Because again, perception, worldview. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself in terms of that. So as you can probably guess from the name Marina Kay, my family's not from America. <laughs> so I was born to a family of West African immigrants. I was the only girl, I was sandwiched in between two boys. My parents were going to college here and various internships and what have you, they moved around um, various parts of the Midwest. We ended up settling in the South. And that's, you know, I, we, I lived in the South, on the West Coast, a couple of different places, but that was, you know, essentially home. That's where I live now. And um, I never fit in and I never really knew why. And I always had different reasons. I was like, okay, maybe it's because I'm kind of tomboyish. I don't have sisters, I don't have brothers. So I like to run and fight and kick. But there were other girls who were tomboyish, so that wasn't it. I was like, okay, maybe it's because, you know, not a lot of diversity in my school, a whole bunch of white faces, you know. So like, maybe it's just, you know, when you're, you know, like a little speck of brown and a sea of white, maybe you're just really different and people see you as different. But that wasn't always it either. And then I was like, okay, maybe it's because there's some social norms I don't get because I'm, you know, first generation American. There's certain things that, you know, people know that they do that are kind of part of their family culture or customs and that aren't part of mine. I was always trying to find a reason, like what was, what was it? Because I was accepted at home, but in society, I was weird. I was different. I talked like a white girl. I, whatever. I didn't move right. I just wasn't like everybody else. And I wasn't really sure why. And um, I, I would do things like go in the mirror and I did this faithfully for days. I would go in the mirror and I would practice how to speak. I would watch my classmates, there was a certain way they spoke. And I didn't really like how they spoke. I thought it sounded kind of weird. But I didn't like having attention called to me. I wanted to blend into the woodworks and just kind of not be, because when you blend in you, and you don't stand out, you're not a target. You don't get hurt, you don't get bullied, you just kind of do your thing. So I would practice speaking and saying certain things and certain expressions and certain movements so that I could, you know, use them and sound natural. I came up with kind of little, you know, mental flow charts in my head of situations. When this happens, you do this. When this happens, you say this. And so on and so on and so forth. And that's kind of how I lived a lot of my life. I have like, my brain is like an internal, like a digital file cabinet of all these different things, you know, that I had to kind of develop and learn to focus, to cope. Um, and and in a way, in a way, it worked. You know, in some ways, in some ways, it didn't because in some ways, it took away from who I really was. Like I have a lot of internal um, stimming that I do, um, and I'm able to do that because you know I learned how to stim without bothering other people's access needs in terms of noise or movement. Um, so, but it's something that isn't visible. So it's important to me now as a person who identifies as a disabled woman to um, not you know to be myself, you know, and so it's important to, so these coping skills have sometimes make you look less visibly disabled and it gives you passing privilege, but is it really a privilege or is it a burden that you've taken upon yourself because you've lost something of your, your own um, authenticity? So um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, some other things that are important to me um, in terms of, so I think about my perception growing up, again, perception and worldview is key, there were certain aspects, traits, characteristics that I viewed. So there were certain um, concepts, I'm sorry, characteristics or traits that I saw within. So I looked at myself. And so, yes, I understand that I am, I'm, again, a child of immigrants, but I'm a black woman. And although, again, the, the black community is, is diverse. It has, you know, there's, you know, people from all different areas. Um, but in terms of being raised in America, there were certain qualities that I saw within the, you know, that I perceived in the area where I lived that were qualities that were attributed to black women and, you know, I guess neurotypical, non-autistic black women. And these were some traits that um, I thought these were things that kind of defined, you know, kind of like the epitome, like what your, you know, traits that you're supposed to strive to be um, like or to have. 
And some of these were difficult for me as an autistic child or, you know, or an autistic you know, coming of age person. I'm gonna share a few of them. So one thing that I thought of was like, I, I viewed black women as someone like the pillar of the family, of the community, kind of like that rock, you know, that keeps everything together. Like, you know, kind of the go-to person who comes up with ideas and strategy. You know, there's a strong matriarchal, I'm sorry, matriarchal, um, you know, tradition, at least in the South, among black women. Um, well, that didn't really seem to me, me. I didn't really have this kind of, you know, come to me and I've got the answer type of thing. I, I could be really uncertain and kind of, flippy flip-flop you know on thoughts and ideas and having that type of responsibility worried me like would I be able to be you know the mama joe of soul food or whatever you know these people that seem to kind of you know withstand struggle and stand strong and you know I would see these women I would look I was like wow I had so much I would watch documentaries about the civil rights movement and these women to me just seemed so fearless and so smart and so on top of things and I was like I whoa, you know, I mean, and I know that you all had a presentation um, for the Flying University about women in the Black Panther Party. I mean, it, these were, these are, you know, capable women, and I just didn't see how this would be something I could be. Another thing was the being assertive and outspoken. Now, I could be assertive and outspoken, definitely, but I could also be quiet and, you know, you know, kind of introverted, um, you know, and so it was difficult for me in terms of black women were seen as so, so real, so, you know, truthful, so bold, and I loved it, but I was like, I'm mm, like a freaking failure as a black woman, you know, I just can't do that stuff. Then the creativity. So one only needs to go on Instagram and watch Kylie Jenner to see the next thing she's culturally appropriated from black women. So if it's hair, music, fashion, phrases, black women are creative. I mean, if it's interesting, if you think about things, I mean, that they, you know, to put together, you know, sometimes even with, you know, depending on one's income level, with very little, you know, sometimes very resourceful in terms of um, creating things and not just, even just hair, music, fashion, literature and art and music. You know, there's a lot of luminaries, you know, black, you know, female luminaries, so creative. And I'm just kind of boring, you know, I like wear black and I'm sameness. I like things that are, you know, concrete and, you know, ritualistic. And so I didn't have that creative flair. I liked it. I thought it was cool, but I don't have an artistic bone in my body. And certain phrases sound absolutely ridiculous coming out of my mouth, you know. So um, the resilience, you know, long suffering, you know, um, I, that kind of goes to the pillar of the family, but just in general, you know, holding it down for, you know, yourself or your people, your whatever, your community. I run out of spoons easily and I can't do, I, sometimes I can't be the rock that folks need to lean on. And then the nurturing piece. That I thought I could do, you know, sometimes, but sometimes I don't want to nurture. Like, you know, I have five kids, I love them, but sometimes I'm like, mommy needs some me time, you know. So it's like, <laughs> I need to recharge, I love you. But, and they're, they get it, they're autistic too, sometimes they don't want to be touched, you know. Sometimes I kiss them and they wipe off the kiss, you know. It, they love me, but you know, it's too much sometimes. So I get it. So these are some things that were difficult for me because of being different. And there's some other things in general about the black community that I saw that are things that I really admired. Like, for example, the family get togethers or community get togethers, like Sunday dinners or barbecues or family reunions. Well, the idea of something like that, throwing something like that in the noise level and the folks hugging and kissing and dancing, just for the sensory, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it, they look so inviting and, and cool. I was like, this is awesome. This is a very important tradition that I don't think I'll be able to do. You know what I mean? Um, some of the meals, you know, particularly in the South, there's certain meals that because of texture issues wouldn't work, wouldn't be things that I'd be able to prepare or eat or because of the way that the, the, they smell. Um, there also is a thing like, so in terms of respect, home training, there's like, there were little jokes that we used to make when I was a kid. Like we'd watch people in the store, right? So we'd be in the grocery store and there's like a kid and I'm just gonna just, I'm just gonna say it like the way I'd say it if y'all were a room full of black people. So a white woman in the store with her little boy, right? Mommy, mommy. Yes, Johnny. I want the cookie. No, Johnny, you've had too many sweets today. But mommy, I want the cookie. No, honey, you can't have the cookie. I want the cookie, I want the cookie! Fine, take the cookie. Now, this was our perception of black woman in the same store, same situation. Mommy, mommy, I want the cookie. No, honey, you've had too many sweets, you can't have the cookie. Mommy, mommy, I want the cookie. No, honey, I can't. Mommy, mommy, I... <laughs> okay, maybe not a fist. <laughs> maybe like a shoe, you know, I don't know. But, or maybe just that look, that side eye. You're gonna get it when we get to the car. You better act right in this store. Home training, be respect authority. You know, you can express yourself, but you also need to have demonstrate some authority, some, some parental authority, and speak. You know, uh, adults, you should yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Those type of things. Well, that seemed so formal to me. I was like, you know, it just seemed odd to me that 
my friends would be cursing up a storm and acting crazy. As soon as their mom walked in, they're like, stiff as a bird again. Yes, ma'am. I'm like, the heck? You're just cursing and doing God knows what. And your mom came in the room. But it was that authority. I didn't understand. To me, it seemed like having a double life. I mean, I was pretty much the way I was. In, I mean, I didn't curse. But I was pretty much the same way I was in front of my mom that I was with other people. I mean, I was just kind of real. Um, wash the dishes. I didn't even use any of them. But OK, I'll wash them. So in, in another black home, it got me popped across the mouth. <laughs> but an autistic mom, she understood. You know what I mean? Wash them anyway. You know what I mean? So, um, so another thing was um, AAVE, or African American Vernacular English, which um, is you know, again, a dialect, um, which is what, just like Spanglish or anything else that people use when they're comfortable with oneself um, in, in one's environment. And it was something that was challenging for me to use. It just didn't seem natural. I've, you know, again, with scripting, I've developed it. And it's something I, I wanted to be able to do because it's something in terms of like kind of a connection with others. Um, and then there are other things, like certain styles of activism. Like, so... I watch, I would, you know, watch things like, you know, Martin Luther King and these other different great, you know, individuals who had this emotive way of dealing with people and these kind of like these marches and these rallies. And those things are difficult if you're autistic. Like I went to the March for Our Lives with Our Children. I went deliberately late, you know, found a spot where I could leave and left. I love those things. They're important, but they're very draining. There's lots of different ways to have activism, but there's certain things that have become kind of attributed to the way, you know, if you look, if it's the civil rights movement or if it's Black Lives Matter or movement for Black Lives or what have you, certain things that people kind of expect out of a black activist that aren't necessarily a natural fit for me. They're a great way to make change, but they're not, a, they're not just a universal way. So, and then parenting. There's some things with regard to parenting. So um, I'm, you know, I don't like small talk and mommy and me groups and all that kind of stuff. Like, the moms are really boring. I'd rather have fun on the floor with my kid, you know, playing. I mean, like, it's just better to me. And then there were, but then there were other things that I did, like, for example, in the black community, in the South at least, they believed in, like, you know, schedules, walking at a certain time, you know, um, feeding your children at a certain time, toileting at a certain time. Me as an autistic parent with autistic children, you know, they kind of had the developmental timetable that just kind of worked for them. We just kind of roll with the flow, you know what I mean? I cope, sleep, and, you know, carried my babies and extended breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of hippie-ish and hokey in the black community. Not, not for everyone, and certainly not on the West Coast, but in the South. So, but there's a few other things. So I'm telling, sharing some things that are kind of like general with regard to socialization and peace, but there's, some, there's a darker edge to this. So um, at work, Sarah talked about a couple of jobs that she's had. So I've had situations where I'm very, very limited at work. So I'm autistic. Um, I don't like hair and drama. I'm, I'm very simple. So um, I used to wear my hair in locks. Now I wear them in braids. Well, there were certain times where, especially when I had my hair locked, I would be concerned, am I going to get a job? Does this look professional? There's, a, you know, there's lawsuits out right now about being able to discriminate against people for that hairstyle. Um, and you know, if I don't have a relaxed, relaxed hair that mimics the way white people wear their hair, am I going to be hired? But I need hair that's comfortable for me as a woman, as, a, as an autistic woman. That's, and plus, it's the hair that grows out of my hair and that texture. I'm a sensory seeker. I like loud music, but black person rolling down the street, loud music, stereotype, right? You know what I mean? I want to play it loud, but hmm, you know what I mean? And then being outspoken, coming up with your ideas, getting excited, not being able to always regulate tone. Well, now you're the angry black woman. You're sassy, loud, you know what I mean? Just all kinds of craziness. Um, different other communication differences, like, you know, I, you know, being free with your body, like music. I love music. But if you're dancing a certain way, oh, she's trying to stick out her butt. She's twerking. You know, now you're this freak, you know? You, know, you, just, you know what I mean? Like, you just can't be you because, oh, I got to watch how I, you know, because, again, some man might get turned on, you know, because they don't have self-control, you know, so whatever. So, you know, it's just ridiculous, you know. But these, so these are different things that you deal with or being seen as not personable because maybe your tone is flat or what have you or um, just so many things. But there, I want to give a, you know, um, a particular story um, that of something that just recently happened to me. So I was driving and... Um, in the, in the car, I had my daughter in the car with me, and I got stopped by the police, because, you know, Texas, that's how we make our revenue, tickets, you know, and he stopped, the guy stopped me, and again, there is lots of statistic about the, you know, the, the disproportionate number of police stops if you're a person of color, particularly if you're black, and so he stopped me, and so he asked me to, you know, come out and step out of the car, and I did, and so I had this, this stimming toy that I have right now, I love this, you know, sometimes it's around my wrist, I have this all the time, I'll be teaching at work, and I'll have this on, so I brought this out, and so now, because he stopped me, I'm kind of freaking out, so I'm more like, instead of just kind of doing it like this, I'm kind of like, you know, because I'm kind of freaking out, right? So he's like, whoa, what is that? And I'm like, oh, it's a stimming toy. 
what is it? What are you doing with it? I was like, oh, I'm just trying to calm down. And you know, he's like, well, put it down. So I put it down. Now I don't have anything to hold. So now I'm flapping because I'm freaked out. You know, I don't know if you're gonna give me a ticket. What you're gonna do to me? You might kill me. I mean, I don't know. So I mean, I really hope not. But you know, I'm just saying, anyone, you know, traffic stops aren't fun, even if you just get a warning. You know what I mean? So um, this flapping that you all in this room just know is just me being an autistic, just doing my thing when I don't have something in my hands. My hands need to move. Loud hands. He could have perceived that as me trying to slap or hit or hurt him. People have thought that of that before. And he could have gone, or he could have perceived this as a slingshot, or who knows, me just having this simple toy in my hand. And if I had a, a delay in auditory processing or answering, or if I engaged in um, echolalia like I do sometimes when I'm nervous, and if he had said, what, what is that? And if I had said, what is that? Like I sometimes do, then he could have thought I was mocking him. Anything could have happened. If I'm not making eye contact, you're being shifty. What do you have to hide? You know, what have you. So it's like you can be in danger. This isn't just, you're quirky, you're different, you're weird. This could put you in danger. You know, there's research studies about the, you know, where they've shown an African-American person shoving someone and a white person shoving someone and, re and asking people, and it was perceived that the person, the African-American person was shoving with violence while the other one was shoving playfully. These aren't just jokes. This is real life. You know, real life being black and autistic means you have this talk with your child. You know, for the, the talk in white communities is the birds and bees. The talk that I have with my sons is, and my older two sons are not autistic. They are neurodivergent. My, my youngest son is the one that's autistic and my daughter. I had to have to talk with them about, don't wear hoodies. <laughs> I'm just serious, no joke. No hoodies, no hoodies. If you are going to, you're going to the mall with your friends, who's going? Javier, Daquan, and John, no, y'all can't go four black people, y'all go four black and Hispanic people going somewhere, or three. No, you can't, that many of y'all can't go to the mall in a group, they'll think you're a gang. No, you get stopped by the cop, you, yes sir, no sir, you give them whatever they want, if they're rude, hopefully they'll be polite, there's a lot of great cops, you know what I mean, but hopefully they'll be polite. If they're not, you take it. They spit on you, they talk to you crazy, you take it. We'll deal with it later. We'll make a report, we'll hand it through the property channels, but you don't take justice now, because there's not gonna be justice for you if you do. I had to have talks with them about don't run. Don't, when you go to the store, what you don't wear and how you don't behave so that you, you know, in hopes that this will keep you safe and it still may not be enough. You know, it still may not be enough. You know, but this is real life. Being black and autistic, might mean that you really like the library, like Reginald Neely Latson in the picture on the upper left. He was an autistic young man who loved going to the library. He, would, he was 17, so he was old enough to go on his own, if I'm remembering correctly. He was waiting for the library to open because he was too early it was there that day. And um, someone in the neighborhood saw him loitering, didn't realize he was a teenager, said so there's a black guy loitering, he has a weapon, he looks suspicious outside the library. The police came and asked him questions. He was nervous, he kind of fled away, didn't answer his, you know, like didn't want to answer, didn't answer, didn't give his name, and turned into a big situation where he was, he, he was assaulted by the cop, he, um, you know, he defended himself, ended up um, imprisoned, um, solitary confinement, just a lot of horrible, horrible human rights abuses for the simple crime of wanting to be, being autistic and black and wanting to go read a freaking book. Or Caleb Moon Robinson, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, actually a great young man. He was an autistic young man who got mad at school. He kicked a, tra a trash can. He was at school, first day of sixth grade. He was in the line, I'm sorry, first week of sixth grade. He was having some trouble with some transitions. So they made a special rule for him that he could not leave the classroom unless everybody else had left, which made him stand out and look weird and different with his peers because everybody else, you're changing six or seven periods a day, can walk to their class and you have to be walked with, by, like a baby with an aide. He got upset one day and kicked a trash can over. And he was charged with felony assault, and a cop, and then an officer, um, whoa, that was loud, sorry. <laughs> an officer handcuffed him for hours, and he was put in jail, his, his parents weren't notified, and he was basically facing felony assault charges, thank you, for, um, for several months until a lot of people advocated in the community um, to get this dropped. These other two individuals, um, Melissa and Antonio, were murdered um, because um, a variety of reasons, abused and murdered, and you know, it appears that sadly, in Melissa's case, there were people who knew something was wrong, but no one spoke up, no one did anything. I mean, if black lives don't matter, black disabled lives sure as F don't matter. The Judge Roddenberg Center, the only place where it's still legal to use electric shocks on disabled people to stop them, and, dis and including autistic people, and there's a lot of people of color. This, is, this place is still open getting federal money. You wear a backpack on your back, and you are shocked. 
if you do an infraction, if you aren't doing something right. That's your discipline. And this is, this is, this is what we call torture. Literally, this is torture, but it's allowed to happen to um, people of color, um, to disabled people of color. So um, I've talked about a lot of things um, and there's, you know, that, are, that are heavy. And so I've talked about problems you know, that we face. The intersection of being black and autistic, there are, some, you know, there are various different qualities and some of them are challenges. But how can you help? You know, how can you be part of the solution and not part of the problem? Well, one thing you can do is support and include all autistic people. So you can be sure that you don't divide us. So whether it's a non-speaking person, whether it's a speaking person, whether it's a black person, a Hispanic person, a queer person, a straight person, however they present, you can speak and refer to and treat them in a respectful manner. Um, and you can make sure not to use ableist language, um, treat us with pity, not using gender-centric stuff like male, male traits and male, you know, and light it up blue, you know, because, you know, more boys than girls on the spectrum. Um, you can make sure that it's not seen as a white thing, because it isn't. It's an autistic thing, you know. So you can, these are some of the things that you can do is just at, in general, oh, if you are inclusive of all autistic people, then that will include the ones of color. You can also be respectful and inclusive of all forms of communication, presume competence. So we all present differently on the spectrum. So um, I am a speaking person, but many are not. Uh, I am no better um, than anyone who speaks using Prolocodico or PEX or any kind of means. I just have a privilege that they don't have. So for you to make sure that when people are using, talking about autism, they're not talking about it in this dehumanizing way. Oh, those poor things, some of them can't even speak. Their moms are just angels for dealing with them. I mean, an angel from heaven, a warrior mom. You know, screw that. You know, oh, I, I've waited all my life to hear my son say I love you. He says I love you every day when he looks at you, when he smiles, when he plays, when he, you know, he doesn't have to say the words I love you. Behavior is communication. So, you know, trying to help people understand and be and look at and kind of presume competence in autistic people. Acknowledging that autistic people are experts in our own lives. So we nothing about us without us. We definitely want allies in any community. You're always going to have important, wonderful allies, friends, neighbors, relatives, partners, professionals. We should all work together, hand in hand. Think about any movement from you know, the abolitionist movement to feminism, what have you. We always need our allies. Allies are important, but allies are to support, not stand in front of, not speak for, but to, to um, signal boost and amplify the voice of people, not speak over them. So if you're in an event, um, about autism, should, there should be someone autistic there representing. It shouldn't just be parents and professionals. There should be someone who is autistic. You wouldn't have a women's rights conference and have all men. Oh, I know a woman. I got a sister. You're not a woman. You know, it's not enough. So that's important. Help us to dismantle ableism and racism. So things from respectful language and depictions. There is so much um, disability inspiration porn. If I see one more freaking Facebook page about some, my son doesn't have any friends, nobody came to his birthday party, could you, he has autism, could you send him a card and tell him how much you love him? Uh, oh, can we make, you know, we'll make them an honorary uh, homecoming queen because nobody's going to vote for her. What is that? You know, no. You know, advocate for diversity and inclusion. Um, bring attention to things that you see. Greater societal problems impact the autistic community even more. So if, you're, if you have multiple marginalizations, things that impact, so institutionalization or, um, you know, different things that, it, you know, exist, different forms of discrimination from misogyny to, trans, you know, to transphobia to, you know, what have you, racism, they impact, if they're impacting the larger, you know, overall greater, um, you know, uh, individuals in that community. And then if you dial it down, it, it's, so macro and micro, it's hurting other people. Speak out against policies and practices, laws that are unfair, be it um, affecting the Americans with Disabilities Act or um, health care or um, things regarding education or mental health, you know, and men, you know, in terms of stigmatizing mental health. Um, have solidarity with other communities and challenge ideas that harm us. So those are some of the things that you can do to help. Here's another thing you can do to help. And you do not have to do this. I'm not plugging my book. <laughs> but I'm very proud. This is my baby. 
myself, Lydia XZ Brown, and um, E. Ashkenazi, um, we um, have edited and put out in collaboration with Autism Women's Network the very first anthology for um, autistics of color. There is nothing else that exists like this. It has individuals from, we've got an elementary school person all the way up to senior citizens, people from different countries, from different backgrounds, uh, from different walks of life sharing our stories. The website is autismandrace.com. It, we, you can find it on Amazon. We, it's a, um, again, we're trying to share the experiences, the lives, the hopes, the challenges, the dreams of, um, of those of us who are at the intersection of race and autism. And this could be a great way that you could learn more, that you could hear our voices, you could amplify our voices. I'm gonna quickly just read this. Um, this, um, this comes from the preface that I wrote. And it says here, what does autism have to do with race? It seems simple, but it is, it is extremely complicated. I urge you to read this anthology and explore this in depth as you dive into the hearts of the authors. They are yellow, brown, red, black, and multi-hued. They are young and old. They share their purpose, their passion, and their pain. But before you embark upon this journey, I have a spoiler. On every page, in every account, from every contributor, you will find one profound universal theme threaded silently and artfully throughout the entire anthology. Again and again, you will find that the answer to the aforementioned question, now unspoken, what does autism have to do with race, is a gentle but resounding everything. In closing, um, I am the um, Autism and Race Com um, Committee Chair for the Autism and Women's Network. Um, we are um, an all-volunteer nonprofit. Um, everyone on our board is autistic. All of our volunteers are disabled. Um, we are um, a small grassroots organization that tries to provide a voice for gender minorities, so um, autistic women, non-binary people, et cetera. And um, it's just you know, so important to be inclusive and to um, ensure that we, do, you know, there's a, um, Chimamanda Adichie talks about the, the, the danger of a single story. So having a single story about autism as something that affects little white boys um, or teenage quirky programmers or people who like trains doesn't include me, doesn't include my daughter, doesn't include my son, doesn't include many people that you all know and love and that I know and love. So let's look at the full spectrum of, of autism with all of its colors and all of its difference and its diversity. Let's celebrate that, not hide from that, not mask that. Thank you.